We can typically distinguish three different kinds of machine learning tasks, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Although the most interesting ones are those where these things are actually mixed up in the same job. We will start with supervised learning, luckily the most common machine learning task and uh, that are every, everywhere nowadays. In a supervised learning problem, the objective is to predict some new information. This can be to predict the occurrence of some events in the future, as if a loan holder would default or if a three speeches would be successful in a new environment, or which is the next word you will want to type in a sentence. The information to predict can also be just some properties that we don't yet know, as the objects that are depicted in an image, or if a bottle of wine is really Chateau Petrus or it is a fake. The information to predict the probability of default, for example, is called label or target or uh, simply the Y, while the characteristics from which to make the prediction, the current debt level, the previous default history, the monthly incomes are the X or the future uh, vector. If the label is continuous, a number, the speed a car can go given its characteristics, the task is a regression. If uh, the um, set of possible value of the Y can take is finite, it is a classification task. In supervised learning, the algorithm is provided with a set of examples of both the X and the Y that corresponds. You give supervision of what the correct behavior is and the algorithm learns the mapping from the X to the Y using this example with the caveat that the algorithm will need to learn a general mapping from the X to the Y and not one specific to the examples we provide to it. So that when we will feed the algorithm a new X, the algorithm uh, that the algorithm never saw, it will indicate the correct Y. This is the problem of generalization, the equivalent to overfitting in statistics, actually the opposite of it and uh, we will discuss it. We will I have uh, later an exercise on digit recognition, recognition. We draw a digit, we scan the image, and we let the computer guess which digit is represented in the image. This simple task is indeed very hard for a computer, and only recently, thanks to machine learning, has been largely solved. The point is that it would be really complex to instruct an algorithm to recognize a digit based on classical engineering procedures. You write the number seven with two lines. I had another horizontal line in the middle. You tap it perfectly vertical. I give it a bit of a slant. You close perfectly the zero while I leave a small gap. For this task, it's much simpler to just teach the classifications with example and let the algorithm find which are the characteristics that make more likely a digit to be a 9 rather than an 8, for example. Another area of application of machine learning is to automatize the discovery of information hidden in large datasets, often highly multidimensional. In unsupervised machine learning task, we ask the algorithm to scan the data and find patterns, hidden structures that would be difficult to retrieve manually. In this class of tasks, we don't provide a label, we let the algorithm find our results from the data by itself. A typical ex example is to recognize 
the presence of a structure that lead to distinguish between different groups in the data, that is to divide the data in several clusters. We will see an example using the famous SAPL dataset, a dataset where the floral species is determined from morphological measures of flower parts. In this case, we could also apply supervised learning, as the why, the plant species, is included in the dataset. But even if this information would not be part of the dataset, a clustering algorithm would be able to separate the observations in different species. Other examples are algorithm of, uh, um, of uh, uh, dimensionality reductions, where we want to reduce the number of dimensions where our data live in, to be able to represent them or to further process for other machine learning algorithms. We will see the principal component analysis, PCA, a technique that linearly transforms the data following the dimensions where the variance is maximized. Finally, we will see reinforcement learning task. Somehow similar to supervised learning, here the algorithm is provided with a feedback, how good the solution is, it provides is. But the feedback concerns only the very final state deriving from the set of decisions that the algorithm has taken. So we will have many attempts uh, or games, each one composed of uh, various actions that the algorithm takes and each action changes the current state of the world until we arrive at the final state and the algorithm is provided with a feedback on how good that final state is. The algorithm will have then to track down how the individual decisions that it made relate to the final outcome. Not but this is a very broad topic. It isn't restricted to broad games like chess or go or to robotic uh, simulations. For example, it can be applied in a business context where you are trying to get customers to sign a contract and have to decide the best actions between sending emails, phone calls, organizing a physical meeting uh, and so on. What is important again is that you need to have a lot of data and in the as in the business example, be prepared for many failures, at least initially. It can be applied to simulations where, to situations where it is imperative to succeed in something where it is the first time you are attempting, as you would miss the experience that algorithm requires for training. Indeed, at the heart of reinforcement learning, there is a universal concept known as explorations versus exploitation. We will see that the way to train a reinforcement learning algorithm includes a first step where the initial experience is not available or it is very limited and we should let the algorithm explore the various options with the objective indeed to achieve a large and diverse experience to then gradually shift toward more and more usage of this experience, exploit the accumulated experience and reducing the exploration. This is very much what happens in learning in everyday situation. I have three kids and only recently I realized the full meaning of the terrible free or sometimes terrible true expression. Toddlers, toddlers at this age looks really terrible. As they are exploring the world around them and making the most crazy experiment like uh, spilling a glass of water on the floor, putting the shoes in a puddle, uh, pulling the pet's tail or eating the dog's nudges. Only later kids learn how to behave, the effect of their actions and start using their knowledge. But this is true also in biological systems. 
When you are young, your immune system doesn't yet know the pathogens, and its response is much more general, dynamic. Adult immune response, conversely, is much more targeted to the no pathogen list. <laughs> it exploits the experience accumulated over a lifetime. This is why a new pathogen as the COVID-19 is much more dangerous to old people than young ones. So, we will see that as in these real-world situations, efficient reinforcement learning algorithms require a training that switch from first exploring the options available to one exploiting the accumulated experience. While the applications of machine learning, the sector where machine learning can be applied, are really diverse, the set of algorithms that we need to study is surprisingly relatively small, as the same algorithm can be applied to very different situations. More than for the specific application, machine learning algorithms differ for their predictive capacity, although some machine learning algorithms can have better prediction for some jobs than others and be worse for other tasks. They also dif di di differ for the computational resources that they require. We already see the trade-off between memory and CPU with online algorithms saving with the former to the detriment of the later. Some algorithms are trivially parallelizable, so they do very well if uh, graphical processing units, GPUs or TPUs uh, are available. Another important element to decide which algorithm to use is uh, how easily it adapts to the, uh, to the kind of data that we have more than to the problem that we have. For example, random forest al algorithms can be directly trained with almost everything, while neural networks require numerical data only, and hence we need, for example, to transform a field weekday to a bunch of ones and zeros to code the same information. Finally, while machine learning are uh, traditionally presented as, as black box, there are techniques that allow to retrieve uh, some insights on the way uh, they form their predictions on the contributions of the input dimension to the prediction. Still, a major drawback of uh, machine learning, for which there is still a lot of work on, is the current difficulty in using the knowledge learned by a model in a given task to perform other, more or less related tasks. Most of the time, we start from zero at each task. We just train the new model from scratch, requiring large computational and data retrieval efforts. But key to learning, at least for intelli intelligent agents, is the capacity to generalize the learned task and transfer this knowledge to resolve new tasks. Some things that go under the name of transfer learning. For example, the basic law of physics that a kid learns using her building blocks can be used later on in life during adulthood. She doesn't need to make fall down many piles of books from the desk to discover that large piles of books are unstable. That's, by the way, the situation in my office. Maybe I didn't use too many building blocks as a child.